First Congregational Church, where everyone's someone and Jesus is Lord. Today we'll be looking at the second chapter of First Thessalonians as we continue our series of What is the Church? Uh, before we do that, though, let's take some time to open our hearts so we're ready for what God has to say to us. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the church that you've placed us to worship in. Thank you for the body of believers you've given us to help us walk with you more perfectly. Help us, Lord, to hear from you today and help us to apply what we learn to our lives for your glory and the good of our fellow believers. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you're doing in our lives. Amen. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is one of those messages that just jumps out of the, of the pages at you. You know, sometimes I have to look and dig and figure out what does God want to say? What is this about? Not this one. This one just bam, you open your Bible and it's like a hand comes out, bam, 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 smacks you in the face. You guys haven't had that experience, huh? All right. Well, read Thessalonians and you'll see because it just, it just jumps right out at you. Now, we're talking about Thessalonians, we're talking about the church, right? I, I don't know if I made it clear last week that this whole series, this, this um, nine-week series, is really about the church. And last week, we talked about how the church in Thessalonica was a great church and how we want to be a great church, too. We said that that church in Thessalonica, it was proven to be a great church because of their faith and their hope and their love and the behaviors that sprung from those things, right? It wasn't just that they had them, it was that they behaved in such a way that, that became example to people all over the world. And so we want to be that great church too. In fact, the, the key verse really for last week and really for this week a little bit too is verse three of chapter one, which says, um, wait a minute, no, actually four, excuse me. We know, brethren, beloved by God, that he has chosen you, for our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. So, so the, the Holy Spirit showed up, and people behaved, and they, they knew the power of God, and they acted it out. But you'll notice the word, came, the, the word of God came not only in words, but also in power. So last week we talked about the power of God being shown and seen in our lives, but we can't forget the first part of the sentence. It came not only in words. In other words, it did come in words. Words are important for us as Christians. We have to use our words. Did you ever have a kid that didn't want to use their words? Right? The little kid, you know, they knew how to speak, I mean, but, but they want something they, eh, 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 eh. Yeah. And what do you say? Use your words, right? You know, we don't know what you want. You're going to have to use your words. Well, the same way for us Christians. In many cases, um, we are living out the power of, of the Spirit in our lives. We are being Christian people in our behavior. We're showing out our faith, our hope, and our love. But then we fail to use our words to tell people about Jesus and about what he's doing in his life. So this, the, the, message title here is the growing church and, and part of being a great church like Thessalonica was was it was a growing church and we want to be a growing church at least I want to be a growing church and I hope you do too and there's two ways that we grow we grow spiritually and we grow numerically both of those are important right um, the fact that as we're growing spiritually, we should grow numer numerically because people will see a difference in our lives and want to know what's going on. And then the other point is, if we're growing numerically but not spiritually, then we're failing because the whole point is to grow closer to Jesus and to walk worthy of our calling. So we need both of those things. And we need words for both of those things. So as I go through here, it's not just, you're, I know what you're thinking, you're going, oh no, Another message on evangelism. I am so sick of hearing about evangelism. Well, yes, sorry. There is an evangelistic tone to this message because part of what we're talking about is sharing the gospel with people who are not of the faith already. But it's also about sharing the gospel with each other. Right? There's, there's also a, a sense that as we walk worthy of our calling together, we need to use our words to help each other. Right? It doesn't do any good just to, say, to, to think, well, I could really help that person, and, and maybe I'll be an example to them. That's great. You should be an example. But if you don't tell them what you're being an example of, it's likely that they'll miss it, and they'll likely they won't get it. So we need to speak the gospel to each other 
and to people in our community that we have the opportunity. Just like I talked to the kids, Nehemiah had the opportunity and he took it and God used that for his glory. All right, so when we speak the word of God to each other or to people outside of the community, we need to do it in a certain way, right? We, we, we have to be careful. And Paul points out here, he's talking to the church in Thessalonica, and he says, when I came and I spoke to you, this is how I did it. And so we can use that as a model for how we can speak to others and how we can speak to our community, all right? All right, so the first thing that Paul did was he spoke with courage. Remember where he was coming from? Um, in verse uh, 2, he says, uh, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the face of great opposition. You remember the story from Acts in 16, they were at Philippi, where they preached the gospel, and they were beaten, and they were unjustly imprisoned, and then they were kicked out of the city, right? So there was some danger involved in, in doing that. And so when they came to Thessalonica, if... And, of course, they were kicked out of that city, too. But he spoke with courage. He didn't, he didn't waver. He didn't say, well, you know, I don't want to get beat up again. Maybe I'll just kind of slink out and go. No, he spoke with courage. Now, here in the United States, do we need that kind of courage? Yeah, we do in a, in a sense. But we're not going to get beat up, right? I mean, if we speak forth the word of God, we, we used to have the street preacher here in town, right? And he would stand on the street corner and he would yell out what he thought was the gospel message, right? Did anybody beat him up? No, he didn't get beat up. Nobody threw anything at him. He, he was safe physically. His reputation didn't do too well, perhaps, but he was safe physically. And you know what? The, we have that, that fear. The reason that we need courage as we speak the word of God to one another or to our community is because we are worried about our reputations. Aren't we? You bunch of Bible bangers. <laughs> right? You bunch of holy rollers. You people are anti-science. Right? You've heard that. You've heard people, well, not maybe about you, but you've heard people use those words. People who are Christians, people who are speaking out the word of God are often look down on or call names or maybe you know maybe you've been in groups where someone has said well i really like to invite that person to lunch but they're such a fundamentalist right you've heard that well that's maybe good maybe you guys are the holy rollers bible banglers and fundamentalists that nobody wants to have lunch with Listen, it's, it, we need to have courage to speak, right? We need, when we're talking about Jesus to people who don't follow Jesus yet, we need courage because it's a scary thing. I want, I want you to think well of me, and I want my community to think well of me, and you want the community and everyone here to think well of you. And so sometimes it takes courage to speak out the word of God that you know is the truth, lest people think less of you. That's really what our courage is needed, is where when we're going to tell somebody something. Now, in the church, it's a little bit different, right? In the church, there is also a need for courage. Several times over the past 10 years since I've been here, people have come to me and said, hey, I think you're wrong. Hey, I think you made a mistake. I can't believe you said that, right? That kind of stuff. And I cannot tell you how much I admire the courage of the people who do that. Right? Because it takes some courage to go to your pastor and say, hey, I think you're wrong. I think you made a mistake. So if you think that, great, let's do that. I, I, I don't always agree when people come, and that's fine. Right? We can, but we have the conversation. But it takes courage to step out of your comfort zone and say to someone else that's sitting in the pew right next to you right now, hey, I think there's something in your life that could be changed. I think that you're not working, walking worthy at this point in your life. So the first point we need is we need courage. If we're going to speak the gospel or speak the word of God to each other or to the community. The second thing we need to speak from is we need to speak from the right motive. He goes on in verse 4 and he says, But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. Not to please men, but to please God who tests our hearts. When we speak the gospel, we have to do it from the right motive. And the right motive is the love of God 
and the love of each other. We have to have the right motive as we speak the gospel. Paul, in here, he talked about many different motives he could have had. It could be greed, right? It could be a money-raising thing. Hey, I'll get some people to follow me. They'll give me some money. That's great. I won't have to do the tent maker thing anymore. Or maybe it's, it's pride, right? Maybe, hey, I, look at my following. Look how, look how everybody is following. Look at the size of our church, man. We're doing great. We got the best church in town. Those are wrong motives, right? Those are wrong motives. In fact, I said at the beginning that I want to see our church grow numerically, right? And I said, I hope that you want that too. But if you are sharing the gospel with the motive of growing the church, it's the wrong motive, right? We, we, don't, we don't share the gospel because we want a bigger church. We share the gospel because we want to glorify God and we want the people we love to know him and walk with him and glorify him as well. And God is the one who tests the hearts, it says. God is the one who knows our motive. So I'm, you may think I have the best motive in the world, right? And I could be totally focused on growing the church. I would be wrong, and someday I'll have to answer to that before God. But we know what our motive is. We need to examine our motives and make sure that we are sharing the gospel with each other and with the community from the right motives. All right, then we speak. I'm going to skip down a little bit um, to verse 11 about how we speak. Um, For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to lead a life worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So we speak like a father to his children, right? We, We speak... Uh, exhortation. We speak a charge. Have you ever, well, those of you who are dads, hopefully you, you spent some time with your kids out teaching them basketball, right? Or teaching them football or teaching them golf or teaching them something, right? And you, you, you want them to do it right. And so you, you try to help them. I remember taking my kids out to, to teach them basketball when they were just little. And, you know, we had the, the hoop down of eight feet because that's the farthest they could throw the ball up, you know. And, uh, and, and they wanted to just shoot the ball up there anyway. And I'm saying, no, you hold the ball like this. And you put one hand here and one hand, you bend your knees. And, and you know, oh, come on, Dad. Right? But, but I worked with them so they had the right form. So as they got older, their shots were accurate and they would do better. I encouraged them. And I tried to help them. And sometimes I told them what they didn't want to hear. I I told them they were doing it wrong. And I said, come on, you can do this. Get it right. You've done that before? Of course we have. We're supposed to do that with each other as well. Right? We're supposed to, to help each other walk worthy of our calling by saying, hey, come on. I you can do better than that. Or, hey, you know what? This has helped me in my walk. I think it might help you too. Or even, this is something you need to do. Wow, that's hard to do, isn't it? Yeah. Part of the reason is because we're congregationalists, right? I mean, let's be honest. We we don't like being told what to do. And, And since we don't like being told what to do, we think that other people don't like being told what to do either. And yet we do it out of the right motive, which we just talked about, then hopefully that will be accepted well. Right? And so as we charge people to walk worthy of their calling, there might be some times when we come off as a cranky guy. I don't want to be a cranky guy. Uh, some of you like to be the cranky guy. <laughs> no, you don't. I'm just teasing. But, but we do need to, to walk with each other and help each other as a father would help his children in whatever they're doing. I mean, particularly in walking with the Lord. Um, It's hard. I understand that. But fortunately, the Bible, Paul here, calls us not to be the cranky guy, right? Because uh, he goes on, and he says, actually a little bit, uh, going back a little bit, uh, we speak with gentleness in verse 7. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse taking care of her children. All right, so that's, that's a picture of the way Paul treated the Thessalonians and how we should treat each other. We should be gentle. Have you ever been, going back to the cranky guy, have you ever been with someone who just constantly is, is criticizing? Constantly you're not good enough, constantly you're doing it wrong, you know, that kind of person? That's not what we want. 
We don't want to be that. It's okay to, to sometimes let things slide. It's okay to sometimes say, okay, that's all right. You can do better, right? It, it's okay to be gentle with each other. In fact, it's not just okay. It's called for. As we're helping each other walk, as we're exhorting and charging, it's okay to do it gently so we don't come off as that guy who's a problem and, and, and doesn't, nobody wants to go to lunch with. I have a great example there. I'm going to skip it. <laughs> No, I know, I know. I just, yeah, it's too long, but all right, all right, maybe later. We'll see. We'll see how we go here. Yeah, yeah it's a little teaser. Next week, come back. <laughs> That's what I said last week. That's right. It's like one of those serials, you know? It's like, it's like the old soap operas that went on for 20 years and it wasn't, the plot never changed. <laughs> I think, I don't know. Okay, anyway, we speak with courage. We speak with right motives. We speak as a father would speak to his children with con um, conviction, exhortation. We speak as a mother would, would work with her child, a nursing mother, gently for the good of the baby, right? I mean, when a mother speaks gently, she, she's not doing it for her own good. She's, she loves the child, and she wants the child to, to grow healthy and to do well, and we should want that for each other as well. Um, you know, Part of this, I guess I kind of skipped it a little bit. We need to tell the truth, right? It goes with the right motives. If our right motive is to glorify God, we have to tell the truth. And so sometimes that's hard to do. That's where the courage comes in. That's where the acting like a father comes in, is telling the truth. And again, as con congregationalists, um, we don't like that too much, right? I, one of the things that frosts my shorts is when... I go to these congregational meetings, and I know I've shared this before, but I, you know, it's one of my pet peeves. And people say, oh, I'm a congregationalist. I can believe whatever I want. Ah, I hate that. Because it's not the truth, right? We believe that Jesus Christ is God, come in the flesh to die for our sins, and he offers us a place in relationship with him. That is the gospel message, and that's what we as congregationalists believe. We also believe that the Bible is the word of God and it's sufficient for guiding us in our lives. That's what we believe. And so to say, well, we can believe whatever we want is a terrible perversion of what congregationalism is all about. And we have to be willing to stand up if we hear somebody say that. Kindly, gently, but honestly say, I'm sorry, that's just not true. And then explain what the truth is. And we have to be willing to say things like that to people in our community when they say, well, you know what, I can do whatever I want because God loves me. Well, yes, God loves you, that's absolutely true. But you can't do whatever you want because God is not only loving, he's just and holy and he has a plan and, and he's got a better way for you. And we need to be able to say that to people because that's what a father would do for his children when he sees them going off the path. And that's what a mother would do if... if Gently, but she would also guide her children. And I'm not saying that we're children. I'm not saying that we, we need uh, other people to guide us all the time. Oh, yes, I am. We do need people to guide us all the time. That's why God gave us each other. We need to be willing to speak hard words to each other in order to help each other walk the path that God is calling us to walk. The other thing we need to do is we need to walk in integrity. In verse 10, Paul writes, You, the Thessalonians, you are witnesses. And God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our behavior to you believers. Right? So you can't speak the word of God if your life isn't showing the word of God. Right? You can't say, uh, you know, you should really eat more vegetables and less chocolate if you're pounding down a bag of Reese cups. You know what I'm saying? I mean, people aren't going to listen to you if you're not living the life that you're, sh you're sharing with them to live. And so we as Christians, if we're going to speak the truth to our neighbors, then we better be living the truth in our homes. If we're going to speak the truth in our jobs, then we better be living the truth in our jobs. And if we're going to speak the truth here in church to one another, then we better be living the truth here in church. Does that mean you have to be perfect? I wish. I don't, I'm not perfect yet. So if one of you are perfect, you can let me know. But basically, no, of course we're not perfect. But 
we have to do the best we can to speak in a, from a place of integrity. We can't, be, we can't be cheating on the job on one hand and then trying to share the gospel with somebody on the other. It just doesn't work. We have to have integrity to put God first. And then, um, let's see, courage, right motives, gentleness, integrity, and we need to speak for their good. We need to make sure that when we speak, we are speaking for the good of others. Christianity, the words that we use are all about speaking the truth in love. And the question is, will we do that? Because it takes courage, and it takes going out of our way, and it takes perhaps looking like the Bible banger, holy roller. I'm willing to do that, though I don't like it. Are you willing to do that as well? Are you willing to love each other enough to tell each other and me the hard truth? Are you willing to have the hard conversations about what the Bible says, about what Jesus is saying, about someone's life and their behavior? It's easy to say and hard to do. Fortunately, God has given us not only each other, but the Holy Spirit to help us as we walk his path. So as we we become aware of something that we need to say, pray that the Holy Spirit would give you the confidence and the words. And be sure that when you're doing it, you are living a life of love and hope and faith. And that's what's That's where those words are coming from. Now, this week, let me ask a question. Does anyone have in your mind right now who you need to speak words of faith, hope, and love to? Anybody? That's probably because we don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. So in just a minute, uh, Lee is going to play. And and as the words will be up on the wall so that you can kind of you know, meditate on them as she plays. But at the same time, let's think, what words do I need to say? To whom do I need to say them? And is my life one of integrity so that the people I'm talking to know that I'm coming from a right place? I was, an old Christian musician used to say, um, don't tell them Jesus loves them until you're willing to love them too. So let's pray for the people that we love, what we ought to be saying, the words we ought to be speaking. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you have given us each other to walk with and to help on your path. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that empowers us and enlightens us. Father, help us to have the words to say in the situations you place us in. Help us to be like Nehemiah, who when when the when the opportunity was there he opened his mouth and he spoke and you used it for your glory lord we want nothing more than to be used for your glory and for the good of those you've placed around us help us lord god help us to live lives of faith hope and love and help us speak the words that need to be said when they need to be said thank you lord jesus amen